You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 227. On today's show, we talk about all things Brazil, including a skeleton of a disabled teen with a bracelet, a 27,000-year-old potential human site, and a horrific story of a notorious slave ship. Let's dig a little deeper into Brazil, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. They got a lot of stuff there. <laughs> Welcome to the show, everyone. How's it going? Hello. Just as a reminder, if you're listening to this in the audio podcast, we are on YouTube as well now. Mm-hmm. Coming over to youtube.com forward slash... I don't know what it is. It's not ArcPodNet. <laughs> Just look for Archaeology Podcast Network. Do we link that in the show notes? We probably um, should. I'm not sure we do. We should Maybe start doing that. Maybe we should start doing yeah, that. Yeah, we've had that YouTube channel for as long as we've had the yeah, APN. Yeah. But we've almost put nothing on it. Yeah. However. Now we do. Yes. Now I'm starting to put pretty much all of the, well, all of the podcasts, even if they don't have video, mm-hmm. onto YouTube. So if yeah. that's where you consume stuff better even if it's just audio, mm-hmm. then head over there. And you can even subscribe to it as a podcast playlist. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. the new episodes will pop up yeah, for you. Yeah, it does all the normal things podcast yep. does. That just started with YouTube, actually. Yep. So. Cool. All right. Well, we have a slightly unintentionally Brazilian-themed episode today. I know, totally. <laughs> like, we're, like, looking for news articles like we always do. And all of a sudden, we had two from Brazil... And I happened to be reading the third one that was also from Brazil. So we figured, hey, let's have a Brazilian-themed episode today. So there you go. All right. Well, let's, uh, I guess, get into this. Yeah. So this first one, I I really thought this was interesting when I first Mm -hmm. saw the, uh, um, the article itself. The headline, I actually saw this a few days ago and then picked up again when we did the research, but um, Mm -hmm. Skeleton of Disabled Teen with Bracelet puzzles archaeologists. Archaeologists mm-hmm. are always puzzled. Yeah, what are they puzzled about? I mean, I guess we'll get to that, but I was I read the article and I'm like what is puzzling exactly? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're not really puzzled yet. Yeah. They're just I mean, everything is puzzling when I, you first find it. I mean, I guess so. Like they're yeah. still doing testing and drawing conclusions. This seems like more of a press release situation rather than a it like is. full like paper, you know, peer reviewed yeah. situation. I mean, this came out July 18th and they said they were, which is a few days ago, mm-hmm. and they said that they are going into the field next week, which probably means shortly after this gets released, they went in the field. Yeah. So, um, they're doing another field season out there, mm-hmm. but uh, some of the stuff that we're talking about was found, you know, between now and 2019 mm-hmm. when they started digging in this area. So, let's get yeah. into it. Yeah. Totally. Um, this is the Serra dos Confucios National Park in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And just cut into the chase here they found a teen they said a teen a teenager um with a spinal condition buried with a bracelet mm-hmm. um, they know the teenager is female but they aren't exactly sure when she lived because uh they're still waiting for radiocarbon dating to come back on that one mm-hmm. um, they've sent it out for analysis but they don't have it back yet they just know that she's pre-european contact basically well, right they're so... assuming that based on some of the other stuff that's been found around there yeah yeah, yeah. so um that's an assumption anyway mm-hmm. and you know Trigger warning for anybody else out there, because I know these are touchy subjects. Not only does she have a a condition that people do have today, um, but she, which we'll talk about, but her full skeleton, or at least from her waist up, is visible on the pictures when you first click Mm -hmm. into the article. So if you don't want to see that kind of thing, then don't click into the article. Yeah, I mean, it's an extremely well-preserved skeleton, so it is, from a scientific perspective, really interesting to look at the pictures. But also, generally speaking, we don't really like condone publishing pictures yeah. of skeletons especially because the people that they belong to or the cultures they belong to like don't really have a say in what we're doing with these pictures mm-hmm. of their people so anyway it's kind of kind of a touchy subject there yeah the uh, interesting thing is the bracelet was found on her wrist right yes. so in the burial mm-hmm. uh, which means more than likely the bracelet was on her list when she was buried yeah yeah and not her list her wrist did I say list? Yeah, I think you did. Okay, wrist. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, on her wrist. Mm-hmm. And again, yeah, 300 to 350 years old uh, prior to European dating, mm-hmm. uh, prior to European contact. Wow, my mouth is just not working right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my mouth is just like completely broken. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Uh, anyway, the condition she had was a severe case of spina bifida. Mm -hmm. And spina bifida is a birth condition, so you're born with it, that causes a malformation of the spine and the tissue around the spinal cord. Yeah, it's basically like the spinal cord doesn't connect properly when it's coming together. Yeah. And it can be nothing, like cause almost no issues other than the fact that it's there and it's like your your spinal cord's not fully connected properly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can like be completely disconnected. And it sounds like this girl had it completely disconnected and like it would have been a severe um, disability for yeah. her. Yeah. So much so that they said it, would, it was unlikely just from looking at her that she'd be able to walk mm -hmm. and would have to have been taken care of for her entire life by the people in her family group. Mm -hmm. And that is always like the thing that is interesting mm -hmm. about cases like this is because it's so easy to assume that populations pre I don't know, like pre modern populations yeah. didn't take care of their people with disabilities. I but know that's just dumb. it's yeah, it's just simply not the case. Like people five hundred years ago or two thousand years ago or even ten thousand years ago cared for their people and if they had a disability, they probably took care of them then too. And this is just another example of people taking care of somebody. I mean listen, if you're hunting and gathering and you're not staying in one spot for very long it's going to be more difficult to mm -hmm. take care of somebody like that. And they may not be. last as long they just because not. of that. But they're yeah. not just going to like cast them aside yeah, and be like, yeah, see ya. Humans just are not that ruthless. <laughs> no. They're just not. I mean, maybe some mm -hmm. were individually speaking, mm -hmm. but I just don't think that human and maybe that's too optimistic of me. But like, yeah. I just don't think the human population as a whole is that that ruthless. I just don't. Well, and one more indication that she was probably you know deeply cared for by mm -hmm. this family is the bracelet she was wearing had around a thousand small beads on it mm -hmm. um, the material is still unknown because they're they're still doing analysis on it but it was likely seeds yeah um, according to one of the lead archaeologists yeah yeah and it's uh it's it's just crazy thinking of that you know it's a relatively small bracelet for somebody who had yeah. small wrists and has a thousand beads on it yeah, yeah. so I, w I would say one thing about that because and this is this is kind of the problem, not the problem with the way media reports things, but they do latch on to numbers like that, the thousand number, and think, whoa, it's so many beads. Yeah. But So my wedding shawl that I knit for our wedding had like mm -hmm. 1,500 beads in it. That's it? Now, yeah. That's a whole shawl. It was a whole shawl. But I mean, it could have had 15 million. <laughs> it could have. <laughs> but I'm just saying that these beads are so small that getting up to that number of 1,000 is like, it actually doesn't take that long, and it's not... It's not as many as you think, you know, like like a very small bracelet ends up having a thousand beads in it because it's so small. It's not to take away from the importance yeah. of it. I think it is important, but could have been just common. It could it could have been. That's I guess that's what I'm trying to say yeah. is that it might have just been like a bracelet that every teenage girl in this time period yeah. was wearing, which still indicates that she was important and taken care of and part of the community. But I wouldn't think that she was like anybody super special unless you had other stuff to compare it to and this yeah. was the most beads or the most important beads or whatever i mean so, aside yeah. from being someone's daughter exactly right. yeah. yeah yeah so yeah and, and it's possible too that somebody you know really scrambled to make this at the last minute as like a burial bracelet oh, maybe they yeah you know and much mm -hmm. like your wedding shawl probably stayed up till two o'clock in the morning <laughs> the night before the funeral uh, yeah and well look you know. sometimes we have deadlines and we just don't make them <laughs> and then you're doing it the night before that's sort of the mo for my life <laughs> and weren't we just researching this episode like minutes before we started recording Don't tell anybody it? That. so <laughs> yeah yeah all right uh, and just so you know the seed bracelets i did a little bit of a little light light uh -huh. research on that um they're made from the i guess it's acai acai yeah, yeah. A, a weird c a i <laughs> Um, although I didn't type it that way because I couldn't mm -hmm. find that character. Uh -huh. um, but that's a fruit. Yeah. And it's made from those seeds. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a kind of a cool article that I just kind of tossed in here. I tried to find Brazilian seed bracelets. Yeah. And you know what? All the links go to Etsy because people are doing these now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you got these really intricate, usually flat, like a like a collar almost, but mm -hmm. flat things with very intricate designs mm -hmm. on them. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they're still made out of seeds. Yeah. And, and the acai seeds back in the day and even today 
um, were, you know, obviously the fruit was, they were taken mm-hmm. out of the fruit and then uh, they were sanded down after they were dried and made into these Horrible. small, uh, small beads. That bra- that brings a question to my mind because going back to my wedding shawl, the beads that I used are called seed beads. Oh yeah. But I don't think they're made out of seeds anymore. I Maybe not anymore. I think they're, well, there's, yeah, they're made out of glass in they a lot of cases. They might just be traditionally named them. Again. Yeah, but when you see seed beads on Etsy, it's not seeds that they're using. They're using glass like the czech glass beads uh, yeah. and um or Swar- swarovski crystals are another one mm-hmm. when they're the really shiny ones and so yeah the seed bead name has really stuck throughout the years but it's not actual seeds anymore well there were also a number of articles mentioning specifically like acai um, that that's seeds. like a brazilian yeah. technique yeah. and, and yeah. being in brazil yeah mm-hmm. so for sure i used to have when i was a kid i had this little loom and if you're watching the youtube video you can see me like making these wild <laughs> gestures but i had this little tiny loom and you would run thread across it and then you could weave in your using seed beads you could weave in patterns and mm-hmm. make that collar like that flat collar thing like you're talking about yeah and i loved doing it it was very time consuming though and it probably did take many thousands of beads to make one i <laughs> think i successfully made like one of them honestly the entire time i had it right. so there you go okay well that's another edition of rachel makes things <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> All right. So they also found the skull of a tapir next to her. Um, and it's kind of kind of close to the skeleton, but they're unsure if there's a connection or if it's just coincidence. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, maybe it was a, a pet. And I what don't kind know. of animal is that? Yeah. So a tapir, I, I had to actually remind myself as yeah. well. It's a, a crazy herbivorous um, animal. So it's an herbivore. Yeah. And it's about the shape of a pig uh-huh. in, in size, but not like a massive pig. Okay. You know? Um, just like one of your average pigs, but it has a short trunk. Mm. So it kind of looks like the cross between a pig, somewhat of an anteater and an elephant. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <Weird>. They're <laughs> wacky. Yeah. Yeah. And another interesting fact is they're all over South America mm-hmm. and it's one of, I didn't write this down, but it was one of only three odd toed ungulates that are still extant, oh. I believe that lived in the area. Okay. You know? Uh-huh. Um, and this one's been there for a while because they came over sometime during the Pleistocene. Mm. Which dates from 2.58 million years to 11,700, mm-hmm. but they didn't come over until the, obviously the isthmus was made between, um, uh, you know, North and South America, mm-hmm. you know, basically around Panama. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, no, that was different. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> YouTube gets all the mistakes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, that was pretty interesting. I thought is, uh, is when they came over now. I don't think they're 2.5 million year old animals necessarily, evolutionarily right. speaking. Yeah. But uh, sometime that in that broad time, time span. And yeah. they are extinct now or they no. they are still around? Yeah, they're still around. They're still, huh? Yeah, oh. we're probably going to get one. Oh, no. Yeah, mm-hmm. we got plenty of room. No, <laughs> yep. not so much. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Um, so... <sighs> yeah, you kind of already talked about that. Anyway, the actual paper for this is uh, linked in the show notes as well, and it's open access, Mm -hmm. so go check that out. Um, And according to the paper itself, um, oh, hold on a second. These are from the other article. Somehow they got jammed in here. Sometimes they jump when you're... Yeah, they totally jumped. All three of these are. Okay. All right. Sorry, YouTube. You get uh, a little glimpse into segment two. (laughs) Um, so that's about all we have for this article today. Uh, there wasn't, there's actually not a lot about it because they're still in process of Mm -hmm. doing things and they're going into excavation. So they're waiting Mm -hmm. on dates and stuff. I'm sure we'll get some papers out in, you know, academic timeframe of six to nine months from now. Yeah. I'm guessing with the great preservation that they have on the remains that they have something that they can date and then they'll be able to get a really good timeframe for when this girl lived and who was taking care of her and who loved her so much that they gave her a thousand seed bead bracelet. (laughs) Indeed. All right. Well, with that, we will take a break and see you guys on the other side. Back in a minute. Welcome back to the archaeology show episode 227, the all Brazil episode. (laughs) Yeah. Today we're going to go over to uh, today. Today is today. Today is today. Today is the same day as it was when we recorded the first segment. It sure is. Sometimes through the magic of podcasting, that's not true, but I'm just an <laughs> idiot in this case. So anyway, uh, we've got another one from Brazil, but before Brazil was Brazil. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the last one was before Brazil was Brazil too. <laughs> true. But uh, only one of these is from when Brazil is Brazil. Right. So mm-hmm. when I say they're all Brazilian, we're actually wrong. Brazilian 
prehistory, I guess. Yeah. Maybe, Prehistoric yeah, Brazil. You know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the article is called, if I can click on it in time here, Early Humans Survived an American Ice Age, archaeologists say. Did so, you find that title like super weird? Well, that's why I immediately clicked on it. Yeah. I, well, that's true. It did draw us in. Yeah. But it does seem to be like missing the point of what this article is about but anyway yeah and again so this is yet another example of humans living in this hemisphere well before we ever thought they did yeah and at this point you know assuming let's assume half of the examples we have that go beyond say twenty thousand years are legit Mm -hmm. okay here's the thing even if only one of them is legit that calls into question everything else yeah right so something has got to be real here Mm -hmm. and this one is just crazy. Um, so they found some necklaces, basically. Um, we're calling them necklaces because you'll see why in a minute. Um, but made from ground sloth bones. Mm-hmm. And that's what's really causing all the, the uh, uproar here. Anyway, they're actually bone pendants. So these things that would have been worn like on your chest, you know, around mm-hmm. your neck. That's why they called it a necklace. But it's like actually... Threaded onto some kind of yeah. something you know leather strap or whatever it was yeah Yeah. exactly um and they were found in the santa elena rock shelter and this is uh somewhere around central brazil Mm -hmm. so the the bone pendants were found with the remains of two extinct giant ground sloths and these things uh estimated to be 3,700 pounds on the average a piece oh wow (laughs) yeah so like elephants basically yes uh if you want to see a real one um watch la brea (laughs) So, <laughs> are we really talking about that show again as if it has anything to do with truth it, and actual listen, history? The fact that they put a giant ground sloth in the Brea is actually a little bit uh, impressive, to be honest yeah, with you. Well, I guess. Yeah. You know, Google mm. extinct mammals from North America and just throw them all in there. Or just like visit the tar pits and throw all that in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyway, the pendants didn't actually come from the skeletons. They are giant ground sloth bone. Mm -hmm. Uh, We know that. Um, But they didn't come from the skeletons of the animals. That they found in the cave? No, no, no. They were from the animals in the cave, Uh but not their skeletons. Right, right. It was from their osteoderms, which are, um, it's like armadillo armor, but it's still bone. So it's kind of on, it's on the outside. Uh Uh-huh. And it was, and they have, they have lots of them. You know, it's not oh. like a, not like a, uh, what am I trying to think? Like a stegosaur, mm-hmm. um, stegosaurus or anything like that. But they said it's more akin to like an armadillo's armor and okay. it's like a hard outer shell, but it's not a shell. It's bone. Okay. Yeah. And so they know these pendants came from some of the animals that are also in the cave. Well, let me jump to the end of my notes here real quick because the actual paper is also linked in here and it's open access. Okay. Yeah. And according to the paper, the remains included thousands of osteoderms thousands of them okay presumably from these two extinct ground sloths that died there oh but it would be kind of difficult to tell for sure but but why would they be there if they weren't from them here's the other thing of those thousands only three of them appear to be modified oh that is interesting too yeah and they have clear holes drilled through them yeah like even if water was dripping on it for eons you'd be hard pressed to make a hole like that right right okay interesting yeah and it, it sounds like they bored a hole into the bone. Yep. And then they were able to put some kind of cord or whatever it was through that. And yeah, whatever then they had. wear it as jewelry, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or some sort of symbolic thing, mm-hmm. you know? Oh, drink. All right. <laughs> no, you didn't say rit- ritual, but okay. It's the same thing. Mm. Anyway, they dated the layer. And if you look in the paper, <laughs> just look in the abstract. Mm-hmm. And the abstract even mentions like six different dating techniques that they used. All this crazy stuff and, and these uh, analytical techniques to look at them and just a whole bunch of stuff. They really did their thorough research there, which is mm-hmm. leading me to believe that it's like this legit. is real. Because that's but they, always my question is like, how legit are the dates? Yeah. But if you, they have three different... Yeah, techniques three. I said six, but they use three. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If they have that many techniques coming up with the same thing, then that is yeah. a pretty solid, pretty solid. And I that thing say. is 27,000 years ago. It's, that's yeah. long ago. Yeah, it's a long time. More or older than anything, really. Um, in, That's not quite the oldest site that people think the they've found. It's not quite the oldest site in the Americas? Yeah. In fact, I think there's some in South America that oh, are yeah. supposed to be older. Like well, Monte Alban, I well, think, is true. or something. But like, there's a lot of sites that are sort of iffy as far as their dating. Well, so, if you ask some people, they're all iffy. Yeah, that's because true. Because if even any one of these, like I said, is dated to the even the late teens, mm-hmm. 
Uh, I mean, you're talking earth shattering. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, to put this into perspective, this would have been about the time of the last glacial maximum. For those of you that don't understand ice ages, they happen all the time Mm -hmm. and they take, you know, uh, anywhere from, you know, 15 to 20 to, you know, 50,000 years to ebb and flow, Mm -hmm. basically. Um, But at the last glacial maximum, which means the furthest extent of the glaciers, the most glaciers we're going to have after this point, they started warming up and and shrinking. Mm -hmm. But because glaciers suck up all the water, um, they got to get that water from somewhere. And it usually comes from the oceans. Right. And the oceans themselves would have been about 400 feet lower than they are today, which is a lot. That'll like translate to miles of shoreline, like miles of it that is now exposed. Yeah. I mean, sometimes even like 10 feet translates into half a mile in some places. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And and that goes back to the idea that like there might be all this old evidence for people being here earlier than we ever thought, but it might be underwater. Yeah. And, and water can sometimes preserve things, but it can also sometimes destroy things. So that evidence might be completely gone, never to be found again. Well, and as an aside a little bit, there are definitely lots of people out there that are looking at rivers and, mm-hmm. and, and other like water sources that, that go into the ocean mm-hmm. and into larger bodies of water mm-hmm. when they thought bodies of water, especially that they thought were lower at some point in time. Right. And because people, people there's usually archaeological sites near rivers Mm -hmm. if you're gonna look anywhere you're gonna start near a river Mm -hmm. because it's got animals that come there for water so you get those you've got water yeah you've got plants you've got all kinds of stuff the one place i can really think two places i can think of i can see the maps in my heads and i've seen these years ago the san francisco bay Mm -hmm. um that whole area used to be a meadow (laughs) just you know (laughs) south of the bridge right yeah Yeah, that was all like a meadow yeah um in the southern end of that bay Mm -hmm. and i mean it's still kind of marshy down in the the far southern end Mm -hmm. before you really get to like silicon valley but um anyway yeah that used to be a meadow so there's definitely um things under the water there and then Gulf of Mexico, I can think of near the Florida Panhandle. Oh. I remember seeing research about people just following river channels in, and then you get these topographical maps under the uh, under the sea, and you could still see the channels where the rivers were. Right, right, so right. So they've got underwater archaeologists that are trying to use different methods oh, to and, like, follow those rivers. Yeah, and, to find yeah. the sites. Yeah, yeah, that totally. are still buried. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, some of the analysis they did on these pendants shown showed that they were. They should have been worn, mm-hmm. right? Because you not only have the hole that would have had the uh, the cord or something mm-hmm. through it, but you can see characteristic wear patterns on the pendants themselves that look like you know it's banging like and rubbing up against somebody. Thing yeah, thing that happens when it is against skin, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know how or why these things ended up in the rock shelter and in fact two of them were broken and mm-hmm. the other one they said maybe maybe was just lost or dropped. Mm-hmm. The fact that there's thousands of them there. Thousands of the osteoderms Mm -hmm. tells me that maybe this was, you know, there's there's a possibility that maybe this was a source for those kinds of things. Like people knew they were there and they were like, I need another bone pendant because mine's broken and they left theirs there. Or maybe the broken ones were broken. I don't know what the analysis on those was, if those showed Mm where or if they were just showed processing and then were broken, like maybe in the in the process of processing them. Right. Um, Who knows? But uh, I guess the further analysis would show that. But anyway. There's uh, other stuff, too, like rock art, um, human-shaped mm-hmm. figures painted on the walls. Mm-hmm. You can see that in uh, in uh, some of the pictures. And, yeah, lots of stuff. So they also found stone tools near the ground sloth, sloth skeletons. Now, I haven't mm-hmm. seen pictures of these yet. Um, but the bones themselves of the ground sloths are far too degraded to look for evidence of butchery because that's the first assumption. You've got yeah. tools. You've got other stuff. Who killed these things? Yep. You know, and why Why are both of them, two of them in this rock shelter? Right, right. You know, so. Yeah, that is really interesting. And it does, I mean, I, I did go looking to see like what the, not criticisms of this paper are, but like the, the hesitations that yeah. the academic community might have. And I actually wasn't really like finding a whole lot, which makes me wonder why didn't this make a bigger splash when it first came mm-hmm. out? Cause it has, they, these were first discovered a couple of years ago and this is coming back through the, the news cycle, I think because they've done more dating and stuff like that. Yeah. But this has been out for a couple of years and I just wonder if like, if maybe the wear on the pendants is not not stacking up to what sci- other scientists think that it should look like I, you know like what is it like why is this yeah. not making a bigger splash like what is i, I don't know i can't tell from i think from these articles i think people just don't know what to do with it yeah you like, know where it, does it fit and there's no human remains here there's no 
I mean, there's kind of tools, but it sounds like they're super degraded. So like without a better, better preserve better preserved site it's like really hard to draw conclusions on well, a handful of artifacts and and one of the things they mentioned in the paper too was that they found two distinct pleistocene archaeological layers with what they called a rich lithic industry associated mm-hmm. not just like a handful of artifacts yeah a rich lithic industry mm-hmm. uh, associated with the remains of these extinct ground sloths okay. so i think one of the problems with anything post fifteen thousand years ago is we don't know where to put it in time. There's mm-hmm. so many disconnected things that have been found in disconnected areas across North yeah. and South America that they don't they don't connect to anything. They don't mm-hmm. there's not a line that we can draw from one to the next. Yeah. Now, there's not necessarily lines we can draw with a lot of early Native American stuff either that we know about, mm-hmm. but at the very least we can say, well, we knew the, you know, the ancestors of the Cherokee were in this area, you know, mm-hmm. or something like that. And we can we can do in a lot of areas a, a lithic history mm-hmm. going back, you know, 10,000 years plus. Yeah. But we the, can't do that with these. Yeah. The trends are generally speaking very broad, though. Like you'll have the yeah, point typologies sure. are very broad across like North America. And I'm just thinking like when you have this where you have like this site over here with these old things and this one over here with these old things. And it's just, yeah. like you said, it's just hard to like to create like a pattern of not development necessarily, but maybe regional patterns mm-hmm. or even the chronology is a kind of it's kind of difficult when they're yeah. so spread out and so different. So, yeah, it's really hard. And then it, it always brings up the question is like, how do you have these like super old sites down in South America when yeah. up here in North America, we're looking at you know 15 maybe a little bit more is proven but yeah i i don't know the whole question of the peopling of the americas it just is complicated and yeah. there's no good answer right now so. yep there isn't so anyway that's uh that's about it for that one it's pretty cool it's ongoing research and mm-hmm. again check out the article it's actually from the royal society one more thing do you think that those holes could have been made by anything natural like well, could a bird have like no. bored through like that they're too smooth the only yeah. other thing that could have possibly done that just to throw something out there would be water uh-huh. water dripping and then my next question would be could people have shown up you know ten thousand years after these mammals yeah. died and and just use the bones that were hanging out in the cave because like they look like fun and they thought why not let's make some pendants it's possible and i mean they said the bones of the uh not mammoths sloths yeah the the bones of the sloths were highly degraded Mm -hmm. uh, by the time they found them now Mm -hmm. so i don't know what they would have looked like you know yeah five six thousand years ago it depends on the environment in the cave right right and uh and what people would have done with it i I, guess i wouldn't rule that out until they had some solid dating yeah they you know well they have solid dating but yeah they would it have looked like ten thousand years ago they have a good date for the bones but not necessarily for the pendants and so they need to sort of have a connection between those and the dating that they have from yeah, I don't even what know it if, sounds like i don't even know if they can tell that the pendants actually came from those ground sloths if there's a way to do that right Maybe yeah dna if they could pull that the word them, fossil was but, mentioned oh really oh so. and that's that's one of the shoot i did read that in the article yeah. now that you're saying that they did say that it looks like the hole was bored through the bone mm-hmm. prior to fossilization oh okay yeah well that's something i mean yeah. it makes it at least that old however long it would have taken to fossilize yeah fossilization can happen quickly or slowly depending on it, a lot the of factors. environment yeah yeah, yeah. So, so it's we, another question that you can't answer well you, yeah <laughs> i mean they would have to really analyze the conditions of this yeah. cave through time and i don't yeah. think they've gotten that research done yet mm. to know or at least to estimate how long it would take something to fossilize mm-hmm. so yeah totally yeah anyway it's really interesting if yeah. they are as old as as they're thinking right now then that's just yet another puzzle piece that just doesn't fit yet mm-hmm. but it will i'm sure it will at some point researchers will figure it out but yeah it's it's cool to watch it unfolding in front of us though <laughs> yeah all right well we're gonna take a break and on the other side uh we're gonna talk about a horrific story again out of brazil <laughs> yeah. so that's a good lead-in please yeah. join us it's gonna be great it's gonna be awesome <laughs> don't all go right. anywhere yep see ya <laughs> Welcome back to episode 227 of the Archaeotech podcast. It's not the Archaeotech no, podcast. not the right one. <laughs> uh, that was just a short promo for the Archaeotech podcast, a, a show I also host. Oh, you did a really cool episode. Oh, yeah. Like, incidentally, like, uh, check out, if you're listening to this in real time, it was like episode 206 or something, yeah. but it was the last one we released. 
Paul couldn't make it, and I was kind of running short on mm-hmm. some some time, mm-hmm. and so I interviewed basically Chad GPT and mm-hmm. Google's Bard yeah. and asked it digital archaeology questions. I love it. It's so fun. I could hear your side of the conversation and sometimes the other side of the conversation <laughs> while you were you were editing it, and it sounded very fun and like scarily accurate yes i've had so. some feedback already from our oh. friend jf who were, well, listens to this podcast yeah. and is likely listening right now yeah yeah he thought i was incredibly boring <laughs> and that i didn't ask the right questions <laughs> and that it was basically quoting encyclopedia britannica but i think that Wait, was kind you of my, were no, the, chat, the chat you, was well yeah it probably he said was. i should have argued with it more and oh. i was like like try to get it into a into an error or something like that but i, th- I wanted to make the point that People are asking it these questions, and they're taking the answers and using them. So I did try to ask it almost intentionally, like, somewhat well, broad questions. Yeah, and you were focusing on more doing it more like an interview, not a debate, necessarily. Well, I structured are, it I structured it that way, but that yeah, was just for the style of the yeah, show. Um, but, yeah. Well, it is still interesting. Like, if you go ask it basic, basic questions like that, those are the answers you're going to get, and it is a little bit Encyclopedia Britannica, but... <laughs> That is well, the, maybe not wrong. The format of every single question for Chat GPT was I was like, what is the blah 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 blah? Mm-hmm. And it was like it would give me this really insightful paragraph or a couple mm-hmm. paragraphs of stuff, and then said so some examples are, and it was five to ten things <laughs> bullet pointed that try to make its point. Uh-huh. Literally bullet pointed. Yeah. And then it would say in conclusion or summarize it at the <laughs> so end. It was like writing a it college was, paper every yeah, time. <laughs> it was definitely a format. Yeah. And incidentally, this is not a chat gpt conversation but no, no. if you are using chat gpt from open ai it is it is not accurate right and you need mm-hmm. to know that so if you're just having fun with it and it's writing emails for you or something which some people are doing but another friend of mine he said he actually replaced um google search on his android phone with a link to chat gpt and he just asked chat gpt questions because it gives them to him in a it gives him answers in a more conversational way with mm-hmm. all, all the clutter of google yeah but ChatGPT was trained up to September of 2021, and its information is not current after that. Oh, so it's like two years behind, basically. Almost. Okay, yeah. interesting. Now, Google's Bard will search stuff seven seconds ago. Because it's Google. <laughs> well, because they're plugged in. And, okay, so, well, we don't really have to do this because I know this is not that <laughs> podcast, but I'm curious if you notice differences between Bard and ChatGPT in, when well, you were interacting with it or if it kind of felt... I did like Bard right at the end, yeah. um, probably because I just found out about it like mm-hmm, last week, mm-hmm. but I did it right at the end and I, I didn't really get a chance to really argue with Bard, but it did have, you know, some slightly more current information in its examples at least. Mm, okay. Yeah. But it's still screwed up. I specifically asked it, what are advances, some advances in digital archaeology since September of 2021? Oh, you asked that specifically? Specifically. Uh-huh. And one of the examples was from 2020. <laughs> And I'm like, did you not hear the question? <laughs> yeah. So maybe it was published after 2021. One of the questions I did ask it though is I was like I was like, the Architect Podcast has interviewed a lot of people and it sounds like sounds like we're doing a pretty good job. How influential is the Architect Podcast? <laughs> oh, did you? It gave a really good answer. Did I gotta it really? say. Oh yeah. well, I guess you gotta go listen to the podcast although, to hear the answer. Although it started with, Well, the Architect Podcast isn't as popular as some other podcasts. I was like, <laughs> suck it, Bard. <laughs> 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 what? That's like brutally honest. I know. Like, I mean, they're not wrong. Numbers don't lie. It's kind of true, but still. Oh I know we've God. got a small audience by design. Yeah, but, well, you know. it's a niche topic. I mean, you yeah. have an audience that fits the nicheness of the topic. Exactly. It did so say funny. we have ten thousand subscribers, which I don't know what subscriber means in its mm. vocabulary because that's yeah. a weird name. That's a weird word. Yeah. And I don't know how it's getting that. Yeah. We definitely that, don't have ten thousand listens every accurate. episode. Yeah. And not in the first 30 days anyway. Mm. But um, some of them approach that through time. Right. But right. not in the first 30 days, which is kind of the critical metric. Yeah. That's so funny. Anyway, speaking okay. of through time. Yes. Through yeah. time. This is not the Archaeotech mm-hmm. podcast, as we established four mm-hmm. minutes and 52 seconds ago. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> so, All right. So this next article is also from Brazil. And the title is Archaeologists Discover Wreckage of Notorious Slave Ship Off Brazil. And I'm like, weren't all slave ships notorious? But, you know. Y- yeah, well, this one was particularly notorious. And let me just tell you, like, this is not 
This is not a fun news story we, at all. We kind of went down a little rabbit hole of hell on this one, too, with some other stuff that's oh, probably not we, in the podcast. We but. did. Yeah, we'll give a couple facts about just like the slave trade in Brazil and some other things that aren't it's like you should know, but they aren't fun to know, I yeah. guess, is is the moral of that story. Yeah. But so anyway, um, Brazil was, as you might imagine, because most of the the Americas was, it was built on the enslavement of millions of Africans and indigenous people. Yeah. And this is a more recent number. I actually saw a couple different numbers about how many Africans were enslaved and taken to the New World. But the most recent research seems to say that it was around 12, 12 and a half million who were brought to the Americas as early as 1540 or maybe even it might have even been like 1520s. I saw various different dates there up until the 1860s when finally the slave trade was mostly abolished everywhere. So that is a lot of people. Yeah. And I think you found an even worse statistic about oh, yeah. that number. Yeah. It, I saw something that said 1.8 million um, Africans uh-huh. died en route yeah. either from ships, you know, either being scuttled or crashing because it was yeah. kind of a hazardous journey mm-hmm. um, or more likely just, from them just suffering from the hazardous conditions, dying on board yeah. and being chucked overboard. Like not being fed, terrible yeah. disease, like just the awful conditions. So yeah. like 12 million people are enslaved and then like, Almost two million of them don't even make it here to be enslaved. Right. It's just disgusting. Yeah, that's and like insane. what fifteen percent just off the top of my head, something yeah, like that. Something that's like that. it's absurd. Yeah, it's yeah. awful. I mean, even I mean, people back then they thought of slaves as commodities, mm-hmm. and even if that were okay, that's a high percentage to lose. Yeah, it's it's a very I mean, high percentage. Why wouldn't they treat them better in order to <laughs> allow them to survive? To sell them. I mean, I hate to just like perpetuate that, but like as a business person. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, it does. You got to care just, a little bit. It's just like this gross disregard for human life. Yeah, it's that ridiculous. That is, is just mind boggling to our modern brains, I think. But they stole these people. They took them forcibly at a very low cost to themselves, probably, and then turned around and made a profit off of them. So maybe they didn't care that they lost 10 to 15% of them, potentially. Yeah. Or maybe that 10 to 15% was like in losing a whole ship, which is what we're about to talk about in this article. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Well, quickly before we get there, you, you mentioned, you know, you know, horrible to our modern sensibilities, right? Mm-hmm. But I did look up, I had to know oh, which yeah. country and when was the last to abolish slavery. And technically, technically, it was Mauritania, which I wasn't really sure that was, but it's basically in West Africa, mm-hmm. oddly enough, where a lot of slaves were coming from. Mm-hmm. And they abolished slavery in 1981, although it was more of a symbolic gesture because there weren't any laws to actually prosecute people who were enslaving other people. Mm-hmm. And they didn't do that until 2007. <laughs> So yeah, and that was because of massive international pressure. Yeah. And I, I did see another thing where the, um, what was it, the United Nations did an international abolishment of slavery in like 1945 or 1950 mm-hmm. or something. But apparently these guys said, eh, we don't yeah, care. Yeah, I'll just keep doing our own thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are a couple like nuances with these terms that we need to cover, but we'll get there in just a second. So... Of those 12 million Africans that were enslaved and brought to the New World, Mm -hmm. almost half of them ended up in Brazil. Like 5.5 million is what I saw. Now, Brazil is gigantic, but still, like that that almost half of them ended up there is also crazy. I didn't even know that slaves were going to South America, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I mean, I I knew about the Caribbean, of course. Yeah, the Caribbean. But yeah, the... The eastern side of South America probably had a similar development, you know, where they were enslaving people to get shit done. So, yeah. Well, it was the same Europeans that settled there. So, (laughs) you know. Exactly. So, okay. So, let's talk about some terms really quick. There is the abolishment of slavery itself. And then there is the abolishment of the slave trade. Uh, And those are two very different things. And that is what comes into play in this story. So, the... S, I don't, hmm, I'll do my best to pronounce this. The <laughs> Esebio de Queiroz Law, which was passed in Brazil on September 4th, 1850. And that abolished the slave trade, but not slavery itself. 
Mm-hmm. And kind of the same thing happened in the U.S. The slave trade was abolished in 1820, but as we know, the you know slavery itself wasn't abolished until the Civil War. And then with Brazil, it was even later. Brazil was the last country in the New World to abolish slavery, and that didn't happen until May 13th, 1888, yeah. more than 20 years after the United States. So when you have this disparity between when the slave trade was banned and when slavery itself was banned, it means that it created this time period where people could still have slaves they mm-hmm. could still use slave labor they just weren't legally allowed to buy them because the slave trade itself was abolished but that's where the black market comes in and the slave trade still happened in some places it was cracked down on harder more than others like the u.s i think did a much better well I'm going to hope that the U.S. did a better job of cracking down yeah. on the slave trade. I think it did, but I didn't research that. So don't, you know, take me to the cleaners on that one if I'm wrong. But Well, I wonder how much of a factor, too, or legally, I hate to say legally, but mm-hmm. legally, how children of slaves, oh, like if right. they were allowed to procreate. Born, they were, yeah. yeah, and yeah. Do those that automatically was, become the property of the slave owner? They do. Yeah, yes. And, I'm, I'm, and that's not considered slave trade? Yeah, somehow that's not slave trade. That was the only way to get new slaves after the yeah. slave trade itself was, it's ridiculous. was abolished. So, so yeah, all this is just freaking terrible. But Yeah, but okay. that sets the stage for the article we're talking about. It does. So all of those laws and the banning of the slave trade and the abolishment of slavery, blah, 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 it did not stop some slave traders. And one example of one that it did not stop is Nathaniel Gordon, who was an American slave trader, and he carried on you know, bringing slaves illegal, illegally into the Americas until the 1850s. Uh, Daddy G. <laughs> still doing it. Yeah. Pirate. Now, he did kind of sort of meet his end, meet the end of his slave trade days, at least in 1851. Mm-hmm. And there's a ship owned by him, led by him. It was on the way from Mozambique in Africa to Brasuai in Brazil. And they got there by way of the Sea of Angra dos Reis. Mm-hmm. And... Obviously, 1851, the slave trade is already abolished only yeah. for a year, but it has been abolished in in Brazil at this point. And the authorities in the area were onto him and they knew his ship was coming. They were following it. They were chasing him. And because of that, he had 500 slaves on board the ship that he was bringing into Brazil, which is an illegally. ungodly number in a ship that size. Yes. Like, it's even crazy that that many yeah. people were on that ship. But it is believed that he purposely sank that ship with all 500 slaves Jeez. on board, probably in shackles, didn't even know what was happening to them. And all of a sudden water is just pouring. Oh God, it's just like so yeah. awful. But it is believed that he purposely sank it to kind of like cover his tracks so that he could get away. That's insane. The selfishness and dis- I like, I can't, I don't even have words for like how yeah. awful and disgusting and selfish that is. It's like, it happened 150 years ago 170 years ago and it still like just makes me like want to cry it's terrible well mm-hmm. i guess if you're gonna put a somewhat of a silver lining on it it was illegal and was. he did live as a fugitive for the next decade mm-hmm. and, and then the he, u.s wasn't having this either like yeah he, he was a fugitive in like all countries i think right right like, they knew of him like his behavior was not yeah he was he was taking some flack for his behavior for sure yeah well yeah. he he lived in at least at least a little bit of fear, not anything like slave fear, but at least a little bit of fear yeah. um, from getting caught and and finally met a justified end uh, 10 years later in the U.S. in 1862 when they hung him for his crimes. Yeah. But still, like, it just doesn't feel bad enough. Like, yeah. And how many ships did he was he able to bring in illegally before that? Yeah. Too? Or actually, what it sounds like is. Probably when the slave trade was abolished in the U.S. and other countries, he just like moved on south, you know, to places yeah. where it wasn't illegal. And then all of a sudden it was illegal when they finally abolished the slave trade. But he just figured he was above the law. And that arrogance brought him to this situation. And it's horrific that 500 people had to die because of his arrogance, yeah. thinking that he could just sneak them into Brazil. But, you know, something that ugh. I'm just thinking about now we, we talk about slavery a lot in this country, actually, and mm-hmm. maybe it's because I'm an archaeologist and, and, you know, you are, too. And I don't know. I, I hear about different things in like the um, the African uh, burial project and stuff like that, looking mm-hmm. for African cemeteries because mm-hmm. they were largely just like 
plowed over and dismissed yeah um not that the graves were but like the tombstones and stuff so the graves are still there but like we don't know where a lot of african cemeteries were and i'm just wondering though god i never hear this part of the story and if anybody listening knows of somebody we can interview or or a book we can look at or something like that i want to know what's happening in africa because was it europeans controlling the the capture because you had to capture people over there yeah and i'm willing to bet they, they were, just like, didn't forcibly go forcibly taken yeah. right like but what does that mean were there other or, tribes around how how did that go was it europeans doing that or was it enabling enabling like elite africans that were mm-hmm. also doing that and saying yeah you can take these guys but you're gonna pay me for it yeah or you like know? were they trading for some kind of good that they wanted yeah. from the europeans or something like that I, I wouldn't doubt if there was some, some mixture like of that the going two on. Bad, bad. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, somebody's getting paid off. Yeah. But anyway, I'm just yeah. curious about that side of the story because yeah. over here you never really hear about that. No, no. You just yeah. Hear, I mean, as you should, it's the people who were taken that are the, yeah, yeah. the center focus of what we're talking about. But Right. Mm-hmm. But just historically speaking. Yeah. So. Like how did the, the what circumstances yeah. even brought that about? Yeah. Yeah. Well, back to this article, and we haven't even really gotten to what they found here. <laughs> We've just been talking about this terrible history of this terrible person and the like, truly horrific thing that he did. Yeah. But archaeologists from like several Brazilian institutions and also North American inst- institutions, in including the Afro Origins Institute, hmm. they basically knew this story, they knew what happened, and they knew-ish where to look to find it, and they started searching for this sunken ship last year. And the, this article is them announcing that they believe they have found it. Nice. And in one of the articles we linked to, there is a picture of a ship. I'm not really sure that that's the ship. It might be like an open source image that they pulled in. It, the... It's not clear that that is the actual ship it, in that picture. It really just kind of says sections of a slave ship on it. Well, there's that one, and then there's yeah. a, the second link is uh, has a picture of a ship, but it's like a Noah l- link to the photo. Oh, right. So yeah, I, I'm not sure that they're actually even releasing any of that information yet. They might not be. It sounds like this is very preliminary. They've just discovered it. They're just getting into the whole like excavation underwater archaeology. Maybe they won't do a full excavation. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is a like underwater cemetery tomb kind of situation and out of respect for the dead they don't want to disturb it which would be absolutely valid if that's the choice that they make regarding that yeah um but knowing that it's there and knowing where it is and and kind of proving that the story happened the way that our history says it happens is it's nice to get that validation of the story at least yeah. and to know that yeah, 500 people well, did die horrifically. I mean, it, it it goes to partially tell... I mean, we don't know who those people were, and we probably never will. Right. Um, but it goes to, you know, at least put a little bit of a cap on their story, yeah. as, as horrible as that is. But yeah. they're they're so voiceless in, in that, you know, they they probably didn't come from, from tribes and villages mm-hmm. and things where, where a lot of things were written down. Their people, their families long gone. Yeah. And they were just abducted and put on these ships and then forgotten in time. Mm-hmm. You know, and this at least... Gives you know, their, brings yeah. their story back. It's a story yeah. that we never knew about and never would have talked about if it weren't for these these researchers being dedicated to finding the ship. So, yeah, yeah it, it gives a voice back to those people in some way, even though it's still like a really terrible story. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, on um, that like truly depressing note. <laughs> I know. I sound like we're ending an episode of the uh, <laughs> Of uh, top, what is it? Top Gear? No, not Top Gear. Oh, on that, um, yeah. <laughs> it's Jeremy Clarkson. Jeremy Clarkson. On that yeah. horribly depressing note. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, I mean, look up anything you can on this kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and uh, check out the links in the show notes. Yep. There's a number of other articles about this too, so mm-hmm. you know, take a look at those. But anyway, yeah, I think we're gonna call it right there, mm-hmm. and then we will be back next week we are we are working on a series not a series we're working on an episode that's a little more a little more broad talking about some stuff we've done in the past Mm so i'm kind of saying this to make it real and have rachel finish some of the research (laughs) she's been doing on it so yeah 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 i've got a lot of topics that i've been wanting to research so we'll (laughs) see if we get to it but there's so much good like so many good articles being released lately too yeah like there's great research going on and every time i'm like oh i'm gonna just like deep dive a topic another cool article comes out and it's like well we have to talk about that yeah like that's so cool so anyway yeah indeed yeah all right well with that thanks everybody and uh we'll see you next week bye
Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.archpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ArcPodNet. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day.